we go. Good morning, live from Noblesville. Now, Kristen, you'll notice I changed that because I normally say good morning, Noblesville, but somebody pointed out that there's a lot of folks not from Noblesville watching this, so they felt a little bit isolated. So I switched up this morning. I'm going to start out by saying good morning from Noblesville and good morning to where you, wherever you are at. It's so wonderful to be with you on another edition of Mental Health Monday. It is uh, Monday. Uh, May 10th, happy belated Mother's Day uh, to all the mothers out there or mother-like figures. I know you don't have to biologically be a mother to uh, uh, to act in a motherly way. I always say it takes a village and there's a lot of mother-like folks in my life that I got to celebrate yesterday. Kristen Boyce is joining me yet again. She's a mother, but she's also a great, wonderful therapist and owner of Pathways to Healing Counseling. Good morning, Kristen. Happy belated Mother's Day and thanks for being here. Thanks, Mayor Jensen. I'm delighted to be here and look forward to our conversation today. Yes, I have been looking forward to it as well. And uh, we're going to get uh, we're going to get started on a big conversation, kind of going back to some basics here today. It is May is Mental Health Awareness Month in the state of Indiana. It's probably nationally, too, I would gather mental it's health national. awareness across the United States of America. And so we're gonna get back to some basics here and talk about what is mental health? How do we talk about mental health? Do's and don'ts around mental health. Um, you know, what, what we can learn from each other when it comes to mental health. So we're gonna, we're gonna back things up a little bit and, and talk about kind of some basics here very important basics in, in honor of Mental Health Awareness Month. And I will say that if you uh, don't follow online the city of Noblesville, I was excited on Friday, we announced um, our first ever citywide well-being coalition, the Noblesville Wellbeing Coalition, of which Kristen Boyce is on that with me, with some great community leaders. We formed that in partnership with Noblesville Schools. Dr. Beth Niedermeyer, who's a phenomenal leader of our school system, is a co-chair with me on that coalition. And, and the whole, the whole, idea around a citywide coalition is to up the conversation on mental health, to identify more resources for folks with mental health, and to help um, mainstream and, and normalize conversations around mental health in the city of Noblesville. And I want to thank all of you for watching today because you have really helped us feed into that conversation. This was a, we had no idea what a year would, what a year it would be like, Kristen, but it's all led us to this point and we're excited to get that coalition off and running here into the future. So before we get on to our conversation, though, let's get into an exercise that I personally love and need kind of this morning, some square breathing. And I'll let Kristen Boyce lead us through that this morning. So in order to center ourselves in the hard, challenging time in life, this is the first number one strategy I teach is to go back to the breath center into your breath and you can do this anytime any place anywhere no matter what's going on the breath anchors you the breath centers you so we're going to put our feet on the floor we're pressing into the feet we call this square breathing you can go at your own pace um, we're going to inhale for four hold for four and then slowly exhale out our mouth for eight like you're breathing through a straw and you can do as many breaths as you want. I recommend four to five per hour, every hour to get started because we're reprogramming the nervous system. We want the nervous system to go to the breath rather than reactivity or activation in the body. So if we can program our, our brain to go to the breath first, this helps us in those times where we feel highly triggered or activated. So let's do it together. Feet on the floor, pressing into your feet, feeling yourself in your chair. If you're standing, that's fine too. Inhale through your nose. Hold. Exhale slowly out your mouth like you're breathing through a straw. You want to go almost till you have no breath left. Sometimes what I do is if I'm having a really tough day and I'm in shame and I'm not feeling good enough, I'm feeling just kind of in the pit, I will put my hand over my heart center. And I know it sounds cheesy, but I'm telling you it works. And you're going to take an inhale through your nose. Exhale slowly out your mouth. So if you need a little extra, little extra compassion for yourself, a little extra nurturing, and I also teach my kids to do this and I'm like, oh, mom, that's so cheesy. And it's like, you know what, if, if they don't do it now, my goal is for them to hopefully learn it later. And if you're practicing this at home, I promise you we have what's called mirror 
mirror, like you're looking at a mirror, neurons, and your kids will start doing it almost like an automatic response. And that's what we want. We want to go to the breath before we go fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. Fawn is that kind of compliancy, that people pleasing piece, instead of going into reactivity. I so like that. Oh, this. sorry. Yeah, I love that. And and I was going to comment on that because we have, as you all know, a seven week old baby at home. And so we've been working through some uh, sleeping techniques and and how to calm her down. And a lot of that is is mimicking deep breaths around them with your hand actually on their chest while they're sleeping to get them calmed down. So uh, we this is all in line with what we are practicing at the Jensen household right now. So uh, we are truly a. a model for our kids when it comes to how we act and how we expect them to react to us. So I love that. Um, I want to say too, if you're listening online and want to chime in with any questions at any point in time, or just want to say hi, share your thoughts on a topic. We want to hear from you. This is very interactive. Um, we, we want to hear from you. Patricia Bratton already said hi, which I appreciate that. Um, if you want to, you know, feel free to drop us a line on there. We'd love to interact with you as we go through this conversation today. Again, we're going to talk a little bit about today about mental health in honor of Mental Health Awareness Month. We're going to kind of go back to basics, uh, talk about what does mental health awareness mean? How do we approach it with our friends, our neighbors, our family members? Um, kind of just a reintroduction to the whole idea of mental health. So Kristen, with that, precursor laid out for you. Um, I'll let you take it from here to kind of talk about what mental health awareness is and some challenges maybe we face around it. Here's the bottom line of mental health. Everybody, everybody has mental health. So it's really, and I kind of wanted to define it really specifically, emotional, psychological, and social well-being. That's everyone. So when we think of mental health, people are like, oh, that doesn't apply to me, or that's for so I don't have that mental health thing you talk about. I don't know. No. Yeah, I, don't have, I don't have the mental health. Yeah. If you don't have the mental health, that's why we're here talking about the mental health, right? So no. Everybody's got Absolutely. Raise our hand. We all right. have it. And when we can acknowledge that this impacts everyone, we can start humanizing ourselves. We can start acknowledging that there is hard. There's grief. There's loss. There's oppression. There's depression. There's anxiety. There's fear. There's shame. Um, there's joy. There's excitement. We have se- we have the gamut, and it affects everybody. And when we pretend why well, by bypassing what's really going on, we go into hiding. We're like, well, I'll put a mask on. I'll put, I'll put the smile on. Even in the inside, when I feel like I'm dying on the inside, I feel like I'm worthless. I feel like I don't matter. I feel like nobody cares about me. That we're going to, we're trying to change the conversation around what's really going on. So there's a couple of things when we talk about mental health that I think are foundational. One, we have to understand the brain. And we did this early on when we when way back in March when the pandemic happened because everyone was like, okay, I can do this for a little bit. Then we started kind of flipping our lids like I'm in fight, flight or freeze. It was triggering maybe some things that were underneath the surface, grief and loss and trauma that we didn't realize was there. So when we understand the brain, we start going oh, we can understand humans. We can understand what it's like to be a human and what might be going on for you. So this is my little brain model taken from Dan Siegel. I know the schools also try, are trying to teach this for little ones to understand when they get dysregulated what's happening. And so this is this is the brain stem. This is back in the brain. I'm just going to use, I also have my little um, foam model, but I won't get that out. We'll just do this. <laughs> and so we have fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. Fawn is often a new term for people. And that's, again, the pleasing, the the compliancy. These are to keep us safe as when we're children and there might be some turmoil, there might be some chaos, there might be um, lots of chaoticness in the environment, or there might be severe neglect going on. That affects us just the same as what we call a big T trauma. We think like hurricane, tornado, um, something along those lines, sexual abuse, or we think a little T trauma. That could be anything that affects us in a way where we go into fight, flight, freeze, or fawn to stay safe. Those are brilliant mechanisms that the brain offers us. 
those are brilliant ways to stay safe as children. They become maladaptive sometimes as an adult. They were adaptive as kids, they become maladaptive as adults. So sometimes we can go into fight, flight, or freeze, or fawn based on an association from the past, and we can be flipped. We can be triggered. We all have triggers. So no one gets out of that category because we're all humans. So what I'm teaching is to recognize the trigger, understand if you're going into fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. Sometimes we need some deeper therapy to do this work. I invite people, if that's the case, um, to there's lots of resources online. Um, we have local providers here. What we do is we're recognizing, we're building awareness, and we go back to that breath so we can get back to that center. And there's nothing wrong with you. This is the thing. We go, well, there's something wrong with me. No, it's not what is wrong with you. It's what happened to you. What happened to you? Not what ha what's wrong with you. What happened to you? And when we can have that kind of conversation, we can start changing the dialogue. It brings up a lot for me because I'm passionate about this because people think there's something wrong with them. It's what happened to you? What what have you gone through in your life? And people think, well, it's just how, how it was. Well, no, it was, I, and that makes sense because that was their normal. It has had an impact on you. And that's what mental health is. How has it impacted you with your relationships? How has it impacted about how you feel about yourself? How has it impacted you psychologically? How has it impacted you physically? We know that trauma lives in the body because it gets trapped. We don't get to process it in real time. And what happens if we don't get to process those thoughts emotions, body sensations that get frozen in the body and time. And so what we're doing is we're changing the narrative to say, nothing's wrong with you. It's what happened to you. And when we can start that and we can acknowledge each other's pain, you can acknowledge your own pain. We can acknowledge each other's pain. We can start seeing each other as humans. We can start seeing each other as, oh, what's happened to you? Understand someone's story. And then we can own what's our own thoughts. We can own our own behaviors. We can own our own emotions and we can start to heal. Okay, okay. how do I start healing? One is that awareness we talked about. Two is connecting to those core emotions, which I know we've talked in, in length about. And let's name those. This is based on neuroscience. It's anger, which also can be a protector, which also can be fight. So we've got to watch that one because that can go into fight. We have, um, so sadness, this is one that we try to hide. Fear, oh my gosh, we've all been riddled with fear. There's nothing wrong with fear. Fear can propel us to protect ourselves. Fear can also keep us hiding. We also, and there's nothing wrong with these emotions. These are normal. These are healthy. Then we have disgust. That's one people don't really like to talk about. We have joy, excitement, and sexual excitement. And when we can start naming, we can start processing. When we can start naming where it is in the body, we can start processing, journaling, Walking is a wonderful way to regulate yourself. Be in nature. Look at, be out there. Look at the trees. Look at the birds. Breathe in that fresh air. That bilateral movement when we're walking is very soothing and calming. Being with your pets, playing with your pets. That's also wonderful, you know, To and then talking to a trusted friend, talking to someone that you can be authentic with. You can tell the truth with. We are talked out of truth because it wasn't safe sometimes. When we can start telling the truth, we can start healing, telling the truth with love and grace. We can start that healing process and listening to things that help you normalize what you've gone through, listening to podcasts, books, music is so therapeutic. You know, when you go and you put on your music, you can, it takes you into different emotional places. It can take you into different memories, different associations. You know, I like to ask people, what was your favorite concert? Or what was your first album that you got? Or what was the first song you heard on the radio? Um, you know, now we have iTunes and all that. But it really takes us back into, can take us back into nostalgia. It can take us back to places we don't want to go back to. Music can be extremely helpful to move through those emotions and offer us some comfort, offer us some relief. It can change our mood like that. Mm -hmm. So can walking. 
These are just some real quick helpful tips. It looks like you have a question. No, I have a question. I was just going to comment on this because one of the things that I learned the most about last year. So I have in the past and, and at times deal with some anxiety, um, just you know, with family and this and work across the board. So anxiety has been one area that I have 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 researched and and learned a lot about. It's something that I've, I've dealt with myself. But one of the things that you taught me the best of the last year was that anxiety lives in the body. And I, I use that a lot when I'm feeling anxious about something and, and trying to, and again, it, the tough part is I know if I would get up and move or exercise or go for a walk, whatever, it would certainly help clear that. But I do feel like if sometimes anxiety is keeping me from not doing that. Um, so it's this total head and heart game going on here. Um, but, but I have found that movement is so key to help me work through any stresses that I have um, and that anxiety lives in the body. So I just wanted to share that because that was just such a very key point for me in the past year is to get out and get moving. Absolutely, and I'm glad you brought that up because everyone has anxiety, it's on a continuum. Mm -hmm. So we can rate it like on a zero to 10. And people think, well, I'm not anxious. I'm like, everybody has some sense of anxiety and underneath anxiety is often fear fear of um, whatever that looks like. It can be fear of what other people think. It could be fear of we can't get it all done. Fear that how am I going to you know, get everything off my checklist? Fear about someone's reaction, someone's reactivity. Fear is really what rides underneath that anxiety. And when we recognize that we can go, okay, what what's going on? Where am I overwhelmed? Where am I afraid of? to start processing and I love movement is a such a powerful one. That's why I'm so glad you're bringing it up and that the point of it lives in your body. Mm -hmm. So we've got to move it up and out of the body. That's why yep. movement is such an important part of everyday life. Even if you're doing what you physically able to do. Right. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, when it comes to mental health and how we approach that with our, say our family, for example, how do we, if we think, for example, that maybe I think that I'm, I'm dealing with a mental health issue and I've kind of helped, I've gone through the steps you've talked about, I've identified, how do I talk about that with my spouse or with my neighbor or whoever I trust? What does that conversation look like? To be authentic, to say, I feel I'm really struggling right now. I feel sad. I feel depressed. I feel scared. I feel anxious. When we can name it, we can start to begin to give it merit. We can start to begin to process it. We can start to begin not to hide it, to numb it. Because what we do a lot of times is we want it to go away. We don't want to feel like that. We're sick of feeling stuck. We're sick of feeling like that. So we self-medicate. You know, we drink alcohol. People shop. We're on the social media scrolling. We do a plethora of other things. We blame. We judge. We we gossip to get out of feeling like that. And it makes us feel worse. We don't move through it. So the first thing is just naming it and saying it out loud. That's vulnerable. And people are afraid. No, I like how you use the word trusted, a trusted person that you feel a felt sense of safety when you're with to begin to share that. The other thing is telling the truth to yourself. This is where we can get honest with ourselves. Journaling helps us be honest with ourselves. That's why I like prayer too. Prayer can be like, okay. I need to get this out and shame can take us to hiding it. Shame says I'm defective. There's something wrong with me. I am unworthy. I'm a piece of crap, whatever that looks like. And it can block us from saying what we're really feeling out loud. When we all can start saying the truth, we can start freeing ourselves. I know it sounds cheesy. It is so powerful and trauma can take us out of wanting to share because we're afraid because of the conditioning we have in the past. And when we can pick a safe person, we can have a new experience. We can have a new experience where someone can offer empathy. Someone can say that makes sense that you feel that way. What, what do you need? Is there anything I can do? And again, I'm just saying, I see you. I care about you. You matter to me. I'm not going to be able to fix somebody else, right? I can just meet them where they are, walk alongside them, offer them acknowledgement and compassion and grace. If everybody would offer that not only to themselves, but to other people, we would change 
the narrative of how we feel about ourselves because we often get into comparison and we're like, well, they look like they got it all together. Well, look, they they don't seem like they have any issues. That's because we're comparing outsides and not insides. Everyone struggles with shame. Everyone struggles with anxiety on some level and everyone can have bouts of depression on some level. And again, it's on a continuum. And when we can come forward and say, I feel really sad, I'm feeling, I'm having a hard day today. And someone could go, oh yeah, I get that. That makes sense. Tell me more about that. That makes sense. You feel that way. Tell me more about that. Woo. Can't we, we could change the conversations we're having to deeper conversations. So those are all good points on how to address that you know, interpersonally, if you're, if you or someone, you know, is dealing, you know, how to engage the conversation around mental health, what isn't helpful? You know, if, if you suspect somebody is, is having some mental health challenges, opportunities, whatever word you want to come up with, or you yourself, what is not helpful? Oh, I, okay. The first one is, <laughs> well, you're so wonderful. Why do you feel that way? I mean, you're an awesome person. You're so great. I don't know why you feel that way. Now I'm like feeling like ooh, the person on the other side, their intention is so pure. Their intention is to make the person feel better. It doesn't. It makes me want to stuff all my feelings down and go, okay, I'm fine now. Fixing it, offering solutions. So if someone says, oh my gosh, I, I feel so sad and my back is starting to hurt. Well, have you tried this chiropractor and have you taken this whole, you know, these this vitamin and then we start offering solutions? rather than meeting them where they are and just listening and holding the space, open heart, open mind, holding the space to just be in attunement with the person. The third thing is we want to get our thing out. We want to say how we get it and how we understand. And when my grandfather died, this is how we did it. And this is what helped me. And that, that what it does is it shifts the focus to the other person. And then the other person doesn't really feel like you're hearing them because now we've the sender and the receiver has shifted. So not saying how you can relate to that right away. You're going to mirror back what you heard them say, offer acknowledgement. Tell me more about that. Beautiful saying, tell me more about that. How, how do you feel about that? Those are great questions. The other thing is when we go, so solutions and fixing, and then why do you feel that way? Why, why would you feel that way? So now I'm like, Ooh, I should, why do I, maybe I shouldn't feel this way. So going, why would you feel that? Definitely don't want to do that. And what I see a lot of people do is they want to get their thing out. So the person finishes what they're saying, and then the, then the other person says what they're going to say back, rather than holding the space and mirroring what they heard and really empathizing, they want to get what they want to say out next. It's so hard. I know, because I'm like, oh, I could say this, and this would be so helpful, and then I could offer them this piece of advice, or I could give them this name of this doctor, or I could do... If they want that, they'll ask for that. Or you can say something like, is there anything that you need from me? Do you, do you need, are you looking just to be, just to vent? Or are you wanting advice? That is a beautiful question to ask people because sometimes people do want advice. Mm-hmm. I'm only going to give it if they ask me for it. So I mm-hmm. can check and say, do you just want to vent or do you want, are you wanting feedback? Yeah. Well, that's really good because I I use the phrase like we're going to sit in that for a little while, you know, and trying to I'm super guilty of this because I am I try to be a fixer. So I'm constantly trying to come up with a solution and oh, no, 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 you're fine. Um, But I've been trying to focus more on like we're just going to sit in that for a minute uh, and and let let it marinate for a little bit. Um, And and a great example of what you just said, too, um, early on in my time, um, actually was on the campaign trail when I was running for this job, I'd, I'd come home after getting, you know, yelled at by somebody about something, you know, and I came home and I would tell Julie Jensen about it. I was like, Oh, can you believe that this person met me? And at the beginning she would, she would start to, she's like, well, yeah, I can, I can see their point and yet and, and start going down on their side. And then we had to have a conversation of like, no, I just need you to hear me out. I, I need you to be on my side for this. You know what I mean? For a little while and communicating that of like, right, I'm not looking for your pile on solution. I'm looking for you to nod, listen, 
let it let it marinate a little bit and hear my side. Um, but that, that's always tough within couples too, I'd imagine, is just trying to understand the intent and what we're looking for from our partner. Exactly. And then if we don't agree with what the partner says, we're going to jump in there and be like, well, that's not what I said. That's not what I did. And I don't I don't agree with what you're saying instead of mirroring it back, even if you don't agree to try to understand what lies underneath the surface. We yeah. focus on the content and we don't focus on the emotion. Yeah. And we can focus on the emotion and go, oh, what did that bring up for you? That brought up so much shame. I'm in a shame spiral. Like, I feel like I am about this big. And it reminded me of when I was, you know, in elementary school and no one would sit with me at the at the lunch table. It, it, like, I know that's really deep, but I just went there. What would that be like if we could talk like that? Yeah. Leave that space for folks to to and ask those probing questions. What are some other you know ways if we're if we're approached by somebody with who's maybe going through some stuff? What are some other good questions that I can have in my back pocket that I can that I can come back with good probing questions because I think that's always helpful. Um, if we're going to try to practice this, can I get one or two or three or four really easy go tos that I can just throw out there? Absolutely. And one is first you have to try on the curiosity hat have a keen curiosity about who the person is in front of you in their story. When you have a keen curiosity about how they really feel, that will sh transcend into the conversation. If you're wanting the person to zip it up and move on, they're going to feel that energy. So you kind of have to check your energy, center yourself so you can be fully attuned. Again, this is key, key, key. So I can hold the space. And this is very hard to do when we feel blamed, we feel shamed, or we feel judged. We want to protect ourselves. So a couple of opening questions is help me understand, help me understand a little bit more about X. Help me understand, tell me more about Beautiful question to do with your children. Tell me more about what that was like when Susie wouldn't sit with you on the bus. Well, it was da 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 da. Oh, and now another question might say, "How did you feel about? How do you feel about that?" Well, I don't know. And then you go, "Oh, I can imagine." Again, tentative. I'm not telling the kid how they feel or someone else. I can imagine that was really hurtful, and you felt really sad and embarrassed. Yes. Now, if they start emoting, great, good. We're processing. We don't need to be afraid of someone's, you know, sadness. That's good. That means they feel safe enough to let it out with you. They feel like they can start processing it with you. So those are good open-ended responses or questions. How, how are you feeling? Not how did that make you feel? Take the word make out. No, I mean, that's, we're giving that power. How did you, how do you feel about it is a much more powerful question um, to help me understand what that was like for you. Tell me more about it. So when in doubt, tell me more about that is a wonderful open-ended processing question. So those are three. I could give you more, but I think let's stick with those and see how they go for you. Well, I think it's really helpful because, again, I think that I would like to get better about asking some of these questions and being prepared. And sometimes I just need a, a go to um, on how to engage. Because I have found recently letting people talk and just listening is, is a, an amazing thing. What you learn about people if you give them the floor and give them your attention. So um, I'm going to work on that in the next couple of weeks. That's going to be my homework assignment for myself. So, Kristen, as always, this has been an incredible conversation. Um, I say going back to basics, but I, I learned a lot even in this half an hour. So it's not basics. It was just very high level. Um, but we've got to start high level and, and having these conversations. And it's, it's a very appropriate thing to do um, in terms of uh, it being May and Mental Health Awareness Month in the United States. So as always, thank you, Kristen Boyce, Pathways of Healing, for joining me. If, if someone is in crisis right now, though, we always leave the same way. Where can they turn? 1-800-273-TALK, 1-800-273-TALK, or you can text 741-741 anytime, any day, 24-7. Please do not try to walk this alone. We have Prevail here in Noblesville locally. If you're under any domestic violence, please reach out to them. There, I should have this memorized. I keep this is one I don't. 1-317-776-3472. Those are great resources. We also have Community North, St. Vincent Stress Center if you need immediate care. 
Awesome. Awesome resources as always. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you can't tell, make sure you wear sunscreen. If you go to the ball field the next couple of days, it's going to be sunny out there. Take care of yourself. If you're not alone and tune back here in two weeks for another edition of Mental Health Monday. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you so much.